time I didn't really feel like I was trailblazing. I was just a, a young girl who loved cricket, had a passion for it, wanted to play as much as possible and was lucky enough to get those opportunities. But I think that the thing that probably made it pretty big for me was the media attention. But that, I, I always kind of maintain that that was the moment that I thought cricket's the sport for me. That, that's interesting because at the time there was nowhere really for you to go, was there? There was no, no, there was no professional women's cricket. I never, I never believed I was good enough to play for England, but I always just want, like I said, I just wanted to play more cricket and I felt like that was probably my goal, was just to do as much as I could for as long as I could. I remember being more nervous making my first team debut for Hayward than I was for my England debut. It made me want to help you, like a young Kate Cross to not have to do what I did, not have to be the first girl to do things, but actually have a really clear path. Welcome along to Emirates Old Trafford for another edition of Beyond the Boundary. And I'm delighted to say that today I've got a trailblazer alongside me. None other than Kate Cross, the first girl to be admitted to the Lancashire Academy. The first uh, lady to play in the Central Lancashire League and one of the original centrally contracted players for England. Kate, I think it's pretty fair to say you are a trailblazer for women's cricket, isn't it? I think when you say all those things, I guess hindsight gives you a, a bigger picture obviously at the time I didn't really feel like I was trailblazing I was just a, a young girl who loved cricket had a passion for it wanted to play as much as possible um, and was lucky enough to get those opportunities so I think that the trailblazing kind of comes with the territory but not what I intended. <laughs> no you wouldn't obviously you wouldn't think that at the time I, I don't think but thinking about it the first girl to be in, in the Lancashire Academy going back to 2006 that must have been uh, a, a very interesting experience and, and possibly quite a scary one for you. Yeah, it was. I, again, I think at the time I was just delighted that I got another couple of training sessions in the week and I was getting to come here and, and do it at a ground that I'd watched a lot of cricket at. And, you know, that felt really special. Um, but I do. I remember it being quite intimidating. I remember going to that first training session. I was 15 at the time and obviously my dad had to drive me because I couldn't drive. And I remember being really nervous on the drive in that, you know, I was going to be training with, at, at the time, what I thought were really elite athletes and, you know, young lads who could go on to play for Lancashire and, and England. Um, but I think that the thing that probably made it um, pretty big for me was the media attention around mm. being that first girl. And I'll always remember how John Stanworth remained so calm about his decision to select me and you know, he always maintained that I was good enough to be there. And if he'd seen a lad with the skill set that I had, he would have selected them to be in the academy. It was nothing to do with being a girl. Um, and I actually think that really helped me with my journey in cricket. Um, not that he took a chance, but, you know, he did something that was out of the norm. Well, that, that's probably how it should be. But it was in advance of its time then, wasn't it? I mean, it, it's how it would be perceived now. Yeah. But then, even though we're only talking not very many years ago 16 17 years ago it feels like a long time well yeah ago. maybe but 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 it was it was um out of the ordinary then yeah it was and like i said there was there was a lot of media attention around it and i had to get stuck into doing live interviews with sky and the bbc and um i remember doing these interviews and then week one of training when the academy actually started and we kicked into winter training week one was around media training and John got the cameras out and said, you know, you're going to have to get used to, to this. And I think I really could have done with this about 10 days ago when the, the media interest, uh, interest started. Um, but that, I, I always kind of maintain that that was the moment that I thought cricket's the sport for me, that I was playing a bit of netball at the time and I loved netball. Um, obviously played a lot of sport at school, but cricket was that, that, that moment was like, you know, I could really take this seriously now. That, that's interesting because at the time there was nowhere really for you to go, was there? There was no, no there was no professional women's cricket. I um, mean, in, in England played, and there was there was sort of amateur county cricket, but that's you, you couldn't have dreamt of forging a career in the game at that time. No, absolutely not. Obviously, like you said, there was no professionalism in the game. If it was, it was it was kind of semi-professional, and mm. the girls that were playing for England were paid a, a basic wage to. You know, there was a lot of subsidising, a lot of coaching, a lot of work with Chance to Shine. But mm. I actually, it's hard to think what my aspirations would have been at that time because 
I never, I never believed I was good enough to play for England, but I always just want, like I said, I just wanted to play more cricket, and I felt like that was probably my goal was just to do as much as I could for as long as I could. Um, I'd been playing for Lancashire first team for two years at that point, which is quite a scary <laughs> thought as a fifteen-year-old. Um, but I think I don't, yeah, I don't know if I actually did have an aspiration to play for England. I think it was just more that I wanted to probably see what what I could get out of myself and what the opportunities would bring. There is no doubt that it helped you coming from a sporting family. Your father obviously was a was a, a very good professional footballer. Your elder brother played decent cricket um, and uh, played good club cricket. So sport within your family was extremely natural, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, there was no no doubt in the summer that I was having to play cricket with my brother in the back garden. I'm the youngest of three, so almost the product of being told what to do and bossed around by, by Bobby, my older brother. Um, I always joke as well that as we went through our cricket careers, me, my sister and my brother, Bobby's an opening batter, I'm an opening bowler and Jen was the wicket keeper, so you could see how it worked in the back garden and I never got to bat. If we ever got Bobby out, that was it. We'd go on inside and play a different game. We weren't allowed to bat. So. Did he not bowl, Bobby? Not very well. Um, so, yeah, that's why I always why I'm, I say it's his fault. I'm a number 11 now. So, um, But, yeah, sport was it was just always part of my life growing up. It was never forced on us, though. Um, I think Dad was always quite um, aware that he didn't want to force us into having to play sport. And I'm terrible at football. I've, I'm definitely not my father's daughter there. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think it was just, you know, I remember my summers just being really bright sunshine you're always in the garden I'm sure it was rose tinted glasses now looking back but you just I think the community that cricket creates is one that you're just always down at the cricket club and um, as I got older I'd get into scoring and doing the tins for the first team or helping mum do the tees um, or was playing in the car park you know we had a little runway strip near the scoreboard that we could we could play as a under 11s group and you know I was just always playing cricket so it, it just felt like it was natural to be doing that and I always wondered what my friends did in the summer holidays when they if they didn't have a cricket club to go to what would they do um, did you go to the cricket club because Bobby your brother played or did your dad play it actually, or was it just because you wanted to go anyway it stems back to my uncle Bob so um uncle Bob, not like, brother Bob not brother Bob uncle Bob does mm. get a bit confusing mm. um he was the under 11s coach down at Haywood and he'd played cricket for Haywood um all his life basically my dad would play down there when he was out of football season so the kind of the the family tree always goes back to Haywood. I was actually born in or grew up in Bury, um, but I when I went down to play my first bit of proper cricket and went down to training, it was it was Uncle Bob that was the coach. So I think that also helped me back then because I was the only girl, you know, stood out like a sore thumb. I was the only one with a ponytail in the back of my hat. So it, I think it was quite nice having the family there to kind of ease me into it. And it was back in the day when Uncle Bob had to be called sir by everyone it was very strict <laughs> strict under 11th coaching but I was allowed to call him uncle Bob as long as no one else was around so how did you progress then to play in the men's first team you were the first woman to play in the central Lancashire league which is a another trailblazing step yeah it was it was actually one of my goals growing up like I said I didn't really have the aspiration to play for England but I always wanted to play first team cricket for Haywood um probably because I saw that every week and you know, it was visible to me and I, I guess the women's stuff was less visible. It mm. wasn't on TV as much as men's cricket was. Um, but I progressed like any of the lads down at Haywood, started in the under 11s, played all the age group stuff. And then it got to senior cricket um, and my brother was first team captain when I was, you know, kind of getting good enough to play senior cricket. And he would never pick me, <laughs> never pick me. There was some political decisions, obviously, in committee where he thought he can't pick his youngest, his little sister. And then he stepped down as captain. He did 10 years of captaincy and um, another lad took over and they needed a bowler. So I got, got to go in the first team. But I remember being more nervous making my first team debut for Hayward than I was for my England debut. I think probably because of the pressure of... Different environment, isn't it? That and also... Playing with all these blokes around you. And also, I, as I grew up playing for Haywood, everyone knew there was a girl that played at Haywood. Mm -hmm. And so there was always just that little bit more interest in how I bowled compared to how anyone else bowled, naturally, because, you know, they've got a girl playing for them. Is she any good? And what about the comparisons then? Because you're in 
you're in the tough school of cricket. You're not one of these opening batters who just swans around and strokes it to the boundary every now and again and, you know, uh, runs very elegantly between the wickets. You're, you're there marking your run-up out and having to sweat, sweat and toil all the way through the day. So what about the comparisons between the men and you, if you like, or were you unaware of that? Yeah, I think I wasn't aware of it. I, and it, it's all I knew. I only knew men's cricket. Mm -hmm. I'd never played women's cricket growing up, other than when I was playing for Lancashire, which was actually quite few and far between. Um, but yeah, I, I think I just wanted to be part of the team. And I wanted people to see me as a cricketer and not as a girl that was playing cricket. And obviously you always got the comments. There was always someone who had something to say when you turned up to an away game. Um, this is a really nice story, actually. Well, it's, it's not nice because I got heckled, but my mum was watching me play third team cricket. Uh, I can't remember where we played. And there was a group of lads sat behind her and I came on to bowl after the power play. And um, power play, it wouldn't have been power play in club cricket, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't open the bowling. You were first change. Yeah, I didn't open the bowling. Hmm. And um, there was this comment, mum passed this story on to me saying that this, these blokes, oh, there's a girl coming on now. This is where we cash in. This is where we get stuck in. And I got four for, and like not many overs. And my mum just turned around to them and went, that's, that's my daughter, by the way. And, you know, she had that little smug, that ability to have that smug story. Fantastic. But, you know, there was always something like that that got said. So I think, I think growing up that I didn't know, again, I didn't really know it was happening at the time, but I think there was almost this need to constantly prove myself when I was playing cricket because you had people who had those views on women playing and um, you know it wasn't as normal as it is now to see a girl playing in men's cricket back then. So I think there was just always that little bit more pressure when I played and that I think in turn spurred me and motivated me to be the best cricketer that I could be. Mm. Um, and then obviously when the the um, when John Stanworth then accepted me into the Lanx Academy, I think that almost gave me even more motivation to keep wanting to prove myself because someone you know in, in quite a big role has made a big decision that's gained media attention and I wanted to prove to everyone that he'd made the right decision and you know it was even though there was a lot of talk about it being a wasted spot because I was never going to progress to play for England and it, I think there was some some monetary gain if someone from the academy yeah. did go on to play for England yeah. there was a lot of controversy around that um, and I think, yeah, it just it made me want to prove to people that John had made the right decision. So th there was, a, I think, a lot of that that has now shaped who I am as a cricketer. I was going to say, in essence, it's hard work being a girl, a woman at that time, progressing into the men's game. And it's quite obvious that you've got a propensity and a liking for hard work by doing what you're doing. Where do you think that's come from? Probably everything that I've just said. I think that element of standing out a lot. You know, you could, you, you just couldn't go under the radar being the girl that played for Haywood. Um, and I, I work. I did work hard. I probably wish I'd worked harder, knowing knowing what I know now. I think if I could go back and do my time again, I wish I'd you know got fitter earlier and and worked a bit harder. But I I, I do just think my passion for the game got me through a lot of it because I loved playing and I wanted to play at every opportunity. Um, I saw how much fun my brother was having at the weekend with his mates going out playing in the first team. You know, I wanted that. I craved that. I then kind of found a lot of like-minded girls who were going through the same journey as me when I first started playing for Lancashire. They all had the same story of playing men's cricket and um, kind of getting the sexist remarks and stuff. So I think there was there was a lot of things that probably went into the pot. And, and like I said, it's easy to look back with hindsight now and realise that, you know, that is where my re my resilience came from or whatever it might be, but just, I just love the game. I just wanted mm. to, to play as much as possible. And I think that's what inspired me and, and motivated me to keep doing it. Uh, aside from cricket, you, you're, you've also worked hard to get a degree. You've got a degree in psychology at, at Leeds, I think, and you've gone on and got a master's. So what's uh, inspired you and kept you going to, to work hard to get those uh, academic qualifications? Well, the first one, when I first went to uni, that was because I needed to get a job. Cricket, <laughs> cric there was no, no career in no, cricket. That, right. So I went to uni in 2010 and the professional contracts didn't come in until 2014. So I went to university with the view that I'd need a degree, find a job that would help me, you know, play cricket as well. Um, 
in a semi-professional state that it was still in at the time. Um, recently, the Masters was more, I'm getting towards that stage of my career where everyone's talking to me about retiring because I'm in my 30s now. So I thought oh, I'd better do something just in case and the worst happens. Um, but I've always had, I think my journey in cricket has always made me want to help you, like a young Kate Cross to not have to do what I did, not have to be the first girl to do things, but actually have a really clear path that would you know, help them play for England or for Lancashire or for Thunder, whoever it might be. Um, so I did a <laughs> master's in um, a, sport, a sports director's master. Mm. Um, I'm not very patient with coaching, so I think I'm more behind the scenes kind of decision making. But um, I think that's why I did it. It was just so that you know, young girls wouldn't necessarily have to have the journey that I had in it. Not that I would change my journey for anything, but you know, I just want girls to think sports are really great option as a career especially cricket because it's given me some of my best times in life it's given me some of my worst times in life but it's given me you know some of the most incredible memories and you want as many girls to think that that can be for them so that's why I think I've been inspired to keep going academically as well uh, in a way they say life or some of the good things in life are about being in the right place at the right time and even though initially in your career so 2006 onwards, there was very little um, women's cricket. It started to snow, the, the effect of women's cricket started to snowball as it got into the early two, the 2000 and teens, didn't it? 2013, 14 were the, the first central contracts. And you first played for England in 2013, I think you were involved in 2011. So when did it start to dawn on you that there may be a possibility of, of pursuing a, a life in cricket almost totally without having anything else around you? Probably the day that we came back from Australia, we did um, What, when you'd won back. the Ashes? Yeah, thanks mm. for mentioning that. Um, we <laughs> did back-to-back -back Ashes, so I wasn't involved in the 2013 home series, but the girls won it back here. And then we went and defended the Ashes in the winter of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and we got back from that tour and we got an email from the ECB about a bonus. And at the time, it felt like this really significant bonus. I think it was like 10 grand or something like that to be, you know, to win the Ashes. Um, and then we went over to the World Cup, the T20 World Cup in Bangladesh in that March. Um, we returned from that trip and we got this email saying that professional contracts were coming in. And it wasn't until I read that email that I thought, right, you know, I might have a job here. If I'm offered a contract, then I could consider myself a professional sports person so mm. um that was really it was quite unexpected because there'd been no talk about professionalism of the game um like the girls were in that semi-professional era of working with chance to shine to subsidize and do coaching whilst they were still training as as england players and i'd just come out of university so i um graduated i think in the summer of 2013 so i i again it was right place right time for me mm. that i'd just finished uni was looking for jobs thinking what could i do um, I'd done a degree in psychology, so I was kind of looking down that route. And then this email landed in my inbox, and next thing you know, you're offered a, a central contract by England. So it was like it was dream come true kind of stuff. But really, until that that email landed, I, there was never an expectation that I was going to have a career in cricket. We had a dream debut in Perth, though, didn't you, in the in the Test match? Yeah, that was pretty special. Even Winning the game, wickets in both innings. What do you get three for thirty five in each innings? Or yeah, it was strange. Like that. Yeah, and then my. The next test match I played, I had the same figures in the game as well. It was six for 70 in both in my first two test matches, which was strange. But um, yeah, that was that was a real magic four days. It was hard work. That was it was hot. I remember it being really hot Like you were getting in the ice bath after every session. Um, I'd never played anything longer than a 50 over game of cricket and then was suddenly exposed to these conditions in Perth at the Wacker. Um, you know, that is that's real dream stuff being able to make your debut in a test match against Australia at the Wacker as a fast bowler you know it was really special and to win that game as well it was back when we just started the multi-format the multi-point series yeah, of yeah. the Ashes and um, it was worth six points for the test if you won so it was a big big win um, but I was exhausted at the end <laughs> of it I remember um, David Collier was the would he have been the CEO or the chairman of the, of the, ECB, the ECB at the time yeah probably 
yeah. and he rocked up to um, the pub that we were in in Perth. We, we always liked to trip away to Perth, the, yeah. the ECB hierarchy. Didn't yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the one that everyone seems to go on, isn't it? Yeah. But um, he, he rocked up with the ECB credit card, so we were all thinking, oh, this is amazing, we've got a free night ahead of us. And it was a, we finished at lunchtime, so it would have been about 2 o'clock we're in this pub, and by 2.30 I was getting woken up because I'd just fallen gone. asleep, completely got the adrenaline had gone. I must have had six hours sleep throughout the entire test match. I was just on a high after every single Well, those swan day. lagers do it to you as well. Yeah, I think I'd only had about two. I was gutted. I missed the big party. But, yeah, it was, a, again, probably a bit of an eye-opener of what was to come because there was that, there was just the doing it because it was there, the opportunity had come. Of course, I wanted to play in a test match. There was no talk about bowling workloads back then or, you know, no. nothing like that. Um, but, yeah, it was a really special, special four days for us. Interesting point that because the format that you that the women play now with the point system in one day internationals and test you don't play very many test matches but I get from just chatting to you here now and knowing you anyway that you really enjoy the challenge of the test match do the do the girls in general um, look forward to playing test matches yeah yeah always and it's wish they'd play more yeah yeah it's always just you get you you always get your coloured kit for T20 cricket and one-day cricket, but the the special package is when you know you've got an Ashes around the corner or potentially mm. when we're playing India or someone like that because you get your whites as well. And it's it's what every kid in the back garden plays growing up, isn't it? It's Or my generation especially, it was always test match cricket. And that was what was on my telly, what I was watching. The 2005 Ashes was just, you know, I remember queuing up outside here in 2005 to what, get in on that final, final day? day yeah mm. I actually snuck in I managed to find a little two two lanes were merging with the queues and I just snuck right through the middle and got in um but it was just I remember that summer being it just lit cricket up didn't it it was mm. just incredible yeah. Andrew Flintoff running in and game making making things happen and changing games and he had a personality. I remember he was the first player that I saw that had this big personality on, on a cricket pitch and I thought that was really special and I wanted to be part of that. Um, so it was always, it was kind of what I was brought up on. You know, white ball cricket wasn't really around back then. and um, So it was still always my dream to play test cricket and it, it's the same for every single player. Now, if you ask mm. anyone they'll want to play a test match, um, I find it such a shame that we don't play enough of it because we almost have to learn as we play, we because you don't play you don't play it domestically, do you? No, we don't, don't play, play any red ball, no. any red ball cricket, and we play two test matches a year now, and that's a lot. When mm. I first started, it was one every three years, mm. and you'd, it would be in the biggest arena of playing in the Ashes, where it really mattered, where the points were heavily weighted for the test match. So you you learn in the the job as you go, and you know one session really teaches you a lot, and then you don't play it again for eighteen months. So it's um. I, th I think it's a real shame in that aspect because I think we'd learn, as female cricketers, I think we'd learn a lot more about the game by playing more red ball cricket. Um, you know, you just got to do your basics for longer and generally the better team comes out on top in, in test cricket. And um, I think that's what, what I love so much about it is that it's the toil and the hard work and the emotion and everything that goes into four, well, five days for us now. We played a five-day test match this summer. but And then at the end of it, you want to do it all again it's crazy you put mm -hmm. your body through hell but you want to do it all again it's just got this um, there's a great degree of satisfaction about it isn't there yeah i think that's something you get from bowling 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 fast it doesn't matter particularly whether you've had week taken wickets or had a good day there is a, a great degree of self-satisfaction to be had just the physical effort that you put in and getting some form of reward at the end of the day yeah do you, and, do you think that? yeah i agree with that and i think there's there's the kind of chess play of it as well and how mm. you the, like the tactics of test cricket obviously if you understand the game and the nuances of it then you see a lot of the ebbs and flows in test cricket but for me it's the being under the you know under pressure of trying to work batters out whilst you're whilst you're out there I feel like t20 cricket you probably do your homework and you know how players play mm. and how you might get them out but there's very little time to set players up whereas in test cricket it's all kind of about that trying to stay one step ahead of the game but you know work players out as you go and I just think that's quite special. So you've had a, a great time winning the Ashes 2014-2015 um, but it's not always been plain sailing for you because a year or so later you hit a bit of a wall and you have a an issue with anxiety and stress 
Um, how, how did that manifest itself? And I know you don't mind talking about it because you have talked about it before. Uh, and why do you think that occurred for somebody who was quite obviously having a good time within the game? Yeah, it was. I think it was actually a bit of a shock to me that I was feeling the way that I was feeling. Um, like I said, I studied psychology at uni. I remember being in a lecture and we were going through depression and anxiety and symptom, symptoms of those illnesses. And I remember being in this lecture theatre and like ticked off five of six of the symptoms. And I thought, wow, that's exactly how I feel. And I remember speaking to my mum and it was a really difficult conversation because I actually find saying the word depression really difficult. Mm. And I remember saying to her, I, I think this is what I'm suffering with. And she, she said to me, she said, I've been wanting to talk to you about this for a while. You've not felt yourself. She um, recognised it, did she? Yeah, she, she, I think she just recognised that I'm quite a bubbly character. I'm quite extroverted and I think I'd, I was quite insular when I was at uni and didn't seem to be enjoying myself as much as 18-year-olds at university should do. Um, and it actually, it, that whole time of my life is actually a big blur. The uh, years kind of merge into each other. And So you're talking about when you were at university and even when you were playing in your early days for England. It, yeah. didn't act, it manifested itself then, but didn't actually come out yeah. until, what was it, 2016? 2016, maybe. so that, uh, yeah, that's three or four years later. So I, I think a lot, it, like I said, it does kind of all, all merge into one, but 2016 was when it all came to a head, basically. And for anyone who has ever suffered with anxiety or depression, it's it's really, I say easy, it's easy to go into your cricket environment and be the character that everyone knows you to be. But it was when I was getting home that I noticed that I was finding all of the cricket things really exhausting because I was putting this mask on. Um, I was, you know, pretending I was having the best time of my life because why wouldn't I? I'm travelling the world with England and getting to play cricket for a living. And actually I was despising every second of it. I was dreading going to training. Um, I was putting so much pressure on myself to perform every single day because I was being paid to do that now. So um, my my hobby, the, my passion that I'd grown up with became my job overnight and I really struggled with that transition. And it wasn't until I started seeing um, a psychologist who, um, a bloke called Mike Rotherham who was working with the England team at the time, I started having um, sessions with him consistently. There were weekly sessions and... Um, this all happened because I basically had a really big breakdown when I got to Loughborough one day. I ended up getting pulled out of a tour to the West Indies. This was the year before the Home World Cup as well in 2017. So I remember there was a re I was having a real big argument with myself about if I tell anyone how I'm feeling, then I might risk a place in the 2017 World Cup squad. If I don't tell anyone how I'm feeling, then who knows what might happen. I'm really struggling. Um, so I was having this internal debate for a long time and it all just came to a head and I remember crying the entire journey down to Loughborough. The only reason I went down was because I was picking Sophie Eccleston up. She couldn't drive, so I had to pick her up en route and I didn't want to let her down. I got to Loughborough and I hid in the physio room. I couldn't even go and see any of the girls. Couldn't face them. Just couldn't face anyone. My, my best friends were in that squad and I, I couldn't bear the thought of being around them. Um, and so... I got the help that I needed. I spoke to our physio. Mark Robinson was our coach at the time, and he said, look, I'm pulling you out of selection for this tour. Go away. Make yourself, you know, get yourself better. Cricket doesn't matter right now. Make sure you're okay. And this is when I then started seeing Mike Rotherham. And actually, again, it's, it's hindsight, and it's really easy with hindsight, but mm. we got to a point about six months later where we worked out that actually me growing up as David Cross's daughter as Bobby Cross's brother, as Jenny Cross's sister, as, you know, a young, one of the young Crosses, I, without knowing, had a lot of pressure on me growing up. And it took us ages to unpick this, but I, I didn't realise the pressure that that came with and the perfectionism that I'd created around myself, the desire to prove people wrong, all went into this pot and kind of bubbled over. But... And also you add the professional contracts into that of, you know, needing to feel like you were doing everything perfectly and, you know, you weren't drinking, you weren't seeing your friends, you were training, you were making sure you got your 10 hours sleep. You're doing everything as well as you possibly could. And I just built this life that wasn't, um, you know, wasn't 
obtainable, I full guess. Of, full of self-doubt Yeah. and lack of self-worth. Yeah, and I think I said it at the start of this interview, but I never believed I was good enough to play for England. So then there was this imposter syndrome as well that came in and... Um, and it was that it was no one's fault. It was just how mm. it had kind of all happened. And being the first girl as well, there was mm. just this natural. Well, Kate will play for England. She must do. So there's this, just this pressure that a, a lot of it was my internal dialogue with myself as well. That oh, I'm, well, I've played for the academy now, so I must do this. I must go on to play for England. Um, so anyway, we got to the kind of got to the bottom of it, and you know we did some hard work. I remember having to have a lot of difficult conversations with my parents as well. Because I felt a lot of pressure when my family came to watch me play. That oh, it happened at Worcester, did it? Yeah, that was the example I was going to use. Yeah. Everyone, had tr it was the first day. So I've been playing for England for years, but this day at Worcester, we were playing Pakistan. And it was the first day that all my closest family had been able to watch the same game. So it felt like a really big deal, and I really wanted to do well for them. And I think Nat Siver hit record runs, and we had our highest total. And um, we should have beat Pakistan. It was, a, you know, a game that we were on paper gonna win and I remember bowling and just getting hit everywhere and my figures were terrible and I remember thinking oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough to be here I'm actually like this is it's all gonna come out now everyone's gonna realize I'm no good at cricket um, and I remember just being on the pitch with my sunglasses on and just tears were rolling down my face and I thought I'm live on Sky Sports here I need to you know something's not right this isn't you know it's, it's you know the dream that everyone sells you just isn't doesn't mm. seem to be what I'm experiencing so um so yeah I had to have conversations with my parents around how much pressure I felt when they came to watch me play and they were laughing at me they were going well, what are you on about you're playing for England we're so proud of you we don't care if you do well you, you're out there representing your country you're representing us um so there's a lot of difficult conversations around mm. that and that's when you I think if you speak to anyone who's played I'm not even professional sport just pr sport in general I think you you have to go back to that kid in the garden like why do you play what do you love about this sport and actually kind of hitting rock bottom for me was that opportunity to refall like to fall back in love with the game um and since then since around 2018 i've i've arguably i've probably had my best years in an england mm. shirt um i've loved the game i've loved giving back to the game i've loved experiencing everything that cricket can give you um i feel like i've got much better balance with cricket and life and travel etc so I feel like in a way it was the worst time of my life but without it I don't think I would I think I would have stopped playing cricket and and not played again well that was a fantastic account of of your the poor time the, the bad time that you had uh, and how you've come out of it and how you realize that without that you, you probably wouldn't have got on to do what you've done now was there any one point something w that you saw, watched, that that sparked you to rejuvenate yourself and say, oh, come on, I can do this again? There was a moment um, just after I'd got back from Loughborough, actually, when I'd had this breakdown. I had three days in my bedroom. I didn't leave my bedroom other than if I needed to use the toilet or get some food from downstairs. I was still at my mum and dad's at the time. And um, my dad came into my room and I think my mum and dad just didn't know what to do. They'd not really dealt with anyone who was struggling mentally and I didn't know what to do. And um, they just, I remember my dad just said to me that they wanted to help me, but they didn't know how to. And he just, he said to me, his quote was, I can't remember where he got it from, but he just said, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And it, it, I just, I really vividly remember him being sat on my bed and my blinds were closed. It was the middle of the day, you know, I've been asleep for a lot of it. And I just really remember not wanting to feel how I felt. And I was just fed up of, like, I'd come home not showered. I'd been, like, like I said, I'd been in my room for three days and I, it just really felt like I was at absolute rock bottom. And I remember that I didn't want to feel that way anymore. And I wanted to get myself better. Mm. And then I think the natural, you know, process of getting yourself better and understanding your mental health more and, how you work, how you function, what your triggers are, got me in a better place, which then made me realise that it wasn't cricket that had triggered me. It was everything that came with cricket, but actually cricket's still an unbelievable sport um, that I'm still really passionate about and still want to be a part of. Um, whether that's for England, I wasn't sure at the time because I didn't know if I actually had... I think I, I felt like I closed the door on that a little bit by not going on that, that winter tour. Um, 
but I still wanted to be part of it. And I think that was what actually kick-started me to make sure I really bought into the sessions I was doing with Mike. And they were really difficult, but you needed, I needed to go through those conversations to make sure that I understood myself to, to be better as a human being before I was better as a cricketer. Mm. Um, so yeah, like I said, it, it all is a bit of a blur for me, that kind of time of my life. But um, there's a lot of people that I think if I, if hadn't they hadn't been around at that time, then I probably wouldn't be playing cricket now. I think I would have probably packed it in and, and not looked back. Well, you, you said a few minutes ago that, that um, from 2018 onwards has been your best time in the game and it's been a good time to be in the game, um, whether you're a man or a woman, to be perfectly honest. Um, but especially in terms of women's cricket, the way that the game has now developed with franchise leagues around, uh, around the world. You played in the Big Bash in Australia um, uh, as one of the first overseas players. Um, how do you... You obviously want to carry on playing, I assume you do, but how do you see the women's game going now, it's going from strength to strength? Is, the, is the, the balance shifting towards franchise cricket or is it still very firmly in, in an international uh, format? That's a really difficult question to answer because I think if you'd have asked me where I saw women's cricket was heading five years ago, I don't think I'd have been able to create or envisage what, is, what we have now as the outcome five years ago. So it's quite hard to, you know, with the, with the way that women's cricket is traveling, it's quite hard to think where it could be in the next five years as well. There is more franchise cricket turning up in our calendar, but we're still at a really strange phase with the global game that not all countries are professional. So you've got the kind of top four or five that are professional with us, Australia, India, South Africa, New Zealand to an extent, but they're still very pretty much underpaid from what I gather. And I think I would rather see the global game rise at the right pace, kind of as a as a group of playing nations rather yeah. than just seeing the top five or top three kind of run away with everything. But without these global tournaments, you, you don't have, without the franchise tournaments, so you've not really got the platform for girls to get exposure and get um, opportunities to play cricket under pressure. So it's, it's a really difficult balance for the women's game at the minute. Um, but like I said, you, I couldn't imagine the game being where it is right now if you'd have asked me five years ago. You know, to have... Well, it's changed for you exponentially really because you're a Lancashire girl through and through you played for Lancashire you played for the Thunder but what happened last year <laughs> you had to play, you went and played for the Northern Superchargers but you were you were um you were picked up by them so there's this fluidity now in the game that is probably very difficult to get your head around as a traditional um women's player and somebody yeah. who's grown up through this um through this system yeah but you're it, there now we are and i am i do play for a yorkshire team <laughs> you, um, can, you can say it <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't no one from yorkshire will be watching this will they? <laughs> um i think again like the men the men have a blueprint they've had they've been playing professional cricket a lot longer than us and they're they've you know used they've gone through the stepping stones that we're going through now but we almost still try and use some of the men's blueprints but it doesn't quite fit in the women's game so you're seeing these auctions and people getting sold across the Pennines to go to different teams and that in the men's game is a lot more normal and a lot more accepted and if you're a professional cricketer you might up sticks and move to Kent because you've been bought to go and play you know your county cricket there whereas in the women's game we're not quite there with the pay yet we're not quite there with the like the used to being moved around and picked up and dropped in a team so it, it it's all the facilities the it's facilities de definitely getting better now definitely since they've brought in the domestic structure and the regional um the way that they've regionalized the the women's game then you know this is for the thunder girls this is home and mm. it's a test match venue it's got unbelievable facilities great coaches who've been part of lancashire and you know really understand the morals of what it is to be a, a lancastrian etc so there's we're very very lucky here we're very well supported and we're we're probably the region that a lot of other teams aspire to look like um which obviously we should be very proud of as as a county um but there's just this element of it's moving so quickly that you know some parts of the game can't keep up with it so you've got a girl who moves up from london but 
the pay is not good enough to be, you know, being able to buy a property up mm. here. It's very different in the men's game. The men will be able to afford things like that. So it's um, it, it's in this really quite finite balance of where where does the funding go? And I think the funding is not quite big enough yet to cover all bases, even though the game's moving at that that exponential rate. So I'm glad I'm not in that decision making. Mm. Um, stage of, of my career yet but it, it, it's great it's un unbelievable it's brilliant to be a part of but there's there's always kind of these um grudges not grudges wrong word but you know there's just these bits where we're like we just want that to be a bit better and that to be a bit yeah, better yeah. and that to be a bit better. you're really catching up basically yeah I th yeah i think that's what but i'm not to get quite at. there yet yeah but it is in in such a healthy state you know we've got 100 professionalized girls in the country mm. now um think back to 2014 less than 10 years ago there was 15 contracted players getting paid to play women's cricket so um it is a really great place to be and that's i think why it's so difficult to think where we could be in five years time um what about the future then for kate cross in five years time you're still going to be bowling how old will i be then 37 37? Yeah, be. doesn't I don't feel like I'll be bowling at thirty so I don't, I don't I don't know. I've never I've not got a date for no an idea. And why would you? No. I I want to keep enjoying the game. Um I feel in a really good place with it at the moment. I feel like I'm really still enjoying it and feel like I can, I can offer a lot. Um training's not a chore yet, which I know when that happens then that's probably gonna be when I start thinking about retiring. But um we've got a World Cup in two thousand twenty five that I'll be really keen to you know, be nice for you to win one of those, wouldn't it? Would be lovely. Um, but yeah, I want to try and stake a claim for selection for that. And then I, I think with the women's calendar now, you you think 2025 ODI World Cup, there'll be an Ashes in 2026, then there'll be another T20 World Cup in 2027. You know, there's always something around the corner. So I think that's what probably keeps us more interested than in the past when you might have had to wait six months for a tour. And exciting times for Emirates Old Trafford because... We've got five games here starting in 2025, I think. Yeah, um, so I need to... You need... Because I, I, you love playing here. I love playing here. I love that I get to call this place my home. And that was... I remember speaking to Daniel Gidney a couple of years ago saying that that's something on my bucket list is to play an England game at home yeah. at Old Trafford, at Emeralds at Old Trafford. So he then gave me the good news that they've got some games. So I was like, right, I need to keep <laughs> keep going and try and get into, into the teams for that. Um, but that, again, that's just... I think I was 23 when I got to play my first game here and it was in the Kia Super League um, and it rained, of course it did. Um, so I think we actually got rained off for the first game but I remember the excitement that I had was like, you know, the seven-year-old in the garden who'd seen it on TV and seen Andrew Flintoff playing on telly here and I, I couldn't believe that I was getting the opportunity to play here. And now this is, you know, where we play a lot of our cricket yeah. and it's the norm and it's we've got a home dressing room and um, we've got our lock. We've got our own lockers. You know, this I, this is what I call home. So, um, it it has changed so much. But I think to play to be able to play an England game here would be on the bucket list and really want to tick that off the to do list. Okay, thanks very much. It's been uh, a, a really enjoyable um, forty five minutes at has least. It? Oh yeah, time flies. Fantastic. For... You've been uh, you've been a, a really good. Uh, Good interviewee, and uh, I think everybody will enjoy listening to you. Uh, I certainly hope so, and we'll get you back in because there's plenty more we, we've got to discuss. So, Kate Cross, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.